Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our heart for the opportunity to be part of something big for God, something that is beyond the, the normal. Help us to step out of our comfort zones, be praying for individual people, bring them on to camp meeting, and see them one for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Enable us in our churches as pastors to be developing interests now of people who are ready, ripe for decision for Christ. We sense that time is short. We sense that the sand in the hourglass of time is running out. We sense that we're in a crisis moment in the history of the world and that men and women are looking for meaning and purpose and hope. Thank you, Lord, that we can be your mouthpiece to this generation to share in the life your message of love, to see people transformed by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. One person can make a dramatic difference in the lives of others. Edward Kimball was a Bible teacher in the 19th century. He was really concerned about his teen class. Edward Kimball made a decision that he would pray for every teen in that class. And he saw each one come to Christ except one. And as he became concerned, he was burdened, he was praying for this young man on his knees night after night. And one day, Edward Kimball is walking by a shoe store in Boston, Massachusetts. And as he walked by that shoe store, he remembered that that young man worked in the shoe store. And so he said, I'm going to go in and make an appeal to him. So he learned where this young man was working back in the back storage room. And he would, this young man was uh, doing inventory for the shoes. Edward Kimball came in, began to talk to Dwight Moody. And he said to Moody at the time, who had not made a decision for Christ yet, he said, young man, have you thought about eternity? Have you thought about where you will spend eternity? Dwight Moody was quiet. And he began to, Kimball began to share the gospel with him. And there in the back of that shoe store, Dwight Moody knelt down and gave his life to Jesus, became a mighty evangelist and rocked two continents for God. One of the young men that came to Dwight Moody's meetings was Wilbur Chapman. Chapman, Chapman came with very little religious background, accepted Christ in Moody's meetings, and Chapman became an outstanding American evangelist. Well, coming to Chapman's meetings, there was a professional baseball player, a pitcher, outstanding player. He accepted Christ in Chapman's meetings. His name was Billy Sunday, not Billy Sabbath, Billy Sunday. <laughs> he accepts Christ. Mordecai Ham comes to Billy Sunday's evangelistic meetings. He accepts Christ and goes down south to preach. And a tall, lanky, young rebel comes into those meetings just to see what was going on. He accepts Christ, and his name is Billy Graham, and he, and he pre preaches to two billion people on planet Earth. Think of what heaven is going to be like when this lay Sunday school teacher, Bible teacher, is in heaven, and uh, think of what it's going to be like when he talks to Dwight Moody. And Moody then tells him about Chapman, and Chapman tells him about Billy Sunday, and Billy Sunday tells him about Mordecai Ham, and Mordecai Ham tells him about Billy Graham. You know, it's amazing the influence of one person. Now, in Dwight Moody's Bible, in the flyleaf of his Bible, in the beginning of his Bible, Billy, uh, Dwight Moody wrote these words. And he wrote them based on Isaiah. And if you have your Bible, please take it in turn to Isaiah 6, verse 8. Dwight Moody writes these words in his Bible based on Isaiah 6, verse 8. Scripture says, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Isaiah 6, 8, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? 
Then I said, here am I, send me. Dwight Moody read that. And this is what he wrote in his Bible. I'm only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. Because I can't do everything, I will not refuse to do the thing that I have been called to do. You see, there is only one you. There is nobody else that is youer than you. You are the only person with your exact heritage. You're, only person, you're the only person with your life story. You're the only person with your personal convictions, your skills, your appearance, your touch, your voice, your style, your surroundings, your sphere of influence. You're only one, and by the grace of God, you can make a difference in the world. I have a set of keys, and uh, do you think this key will open every door? Will it open every door? Will it open one door? What about, what about this key? Will this key open every door? It'll open one door. You can reach people that I can never reach. You are the key to some heart. You are the key to some mind. You are the key to some life. You are only one, but you can do something significant for that other one person, your neighbor, your husband who doesn't know Christ, your wife that doesn't know Christ, your son, your daughter that doesn't know Christ. You are the key to some heart. Does one person make a difference? In 1654, one vote gave Oliver Cromwell control of England. In 1649, one vote caused Charles I of England to be executed. One vote. 1776, get this one. One vote gave America the English language instead of German. Did you know if, we, if it wasn't for that one vote, you and I would be saying, yeah, we'd be talking German. <laughs> we'd be talking German, wouldn't we? In 1839, one vote elected Marcus Morton governor of Massachusetts. In 1845, get this one, one vote brought Texas into the Union. We wouldn't have Texas if we didn't have that one vote. In 1875, one vote changed France from a monarchy to a republic, or else you'd have a king in France today. In, one, in 1876, one vote gave Rutherford B. Haynes the United States presidency by one vote. Something more tragic, in 1923, one vote gave Adolf Hitler control of the Nazi party. And you know what happened? In 1941, one vote saved the selective service system in America just 12 weeks before Pearl Harbor. You know, when I read God's word, I find the story of one man, one woman, witnessing to somebody else for the kingdom of God. Individual men and women make a difference. From Genesis to Revelation, we see in scripture, men and women who chose to give their lives to Christ and they made a difference in their world. In the Bible, we discover the power of one guided by God. One person's make life making a difference for God. One person's decision changing the course of history. One person's actions impacting scores of other lives. One person's witness changing the world. One person's kindness making a dramatic difference in the people around them. Heaven's vision for the last days is one person witnessing to one person who witnesses to one person to change lives for the kingdom of God. Now, there are three things I want to share with you. The promise of Christ for you, the power of Christ for you, and the presence of Christ for you. The promise, the power, and the presence. We begin in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, a text you know well. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. The Bible says, Jesus, in that great sermon on the signs of the times, he talks about wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, talks about nation rising against nation, talks about pestilences and lawlessness rising. Sounds like our day, doesn't it? 
Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end will come. How is that going to happen? When you think of the seven, eight billion people on planet Earth, how is that going to happen? God's going to use one man, one woman, one child. The witness of that person is going to be spread to the next person, to the next, to the next. God's truth is not going to flicker like some candle, blown in the wind and be blown out so we sit in darkness. Look at Revelation chapter 14. You know it well. God's people will rise to their destiny. God's people, revived by the Spirit, will go out sharing his love and grace. And God will multiply their efforts like he did the loaves and the fishes to feed 5,000. And this world will hear the grace of God, the, the truth of God, and the word of God. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them to dwell on the earth. And then what does it say? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and what? People. So God's message is going to go to the ends of the earth. Look at the promise in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14. One of my favorite passages in all of scripture shares with us what God is going to do in the moving of the spirit in the last days of earth's history, and how God is going to use his people in incredibly powerful ways to make a dramatic difference in the lives of others. Habakkuk, second chapter, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We read three texts. First, Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Revelation 14, verse 6, the gospel is going to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Habakkuk chapter 2, the earth is going to be filled with the glory of the knowledge of God. This Bible truth of, the, of Jesus' love and grace is not going to be blown out like a candle, not at all. Now think about it for a moment. How is God going to fulfill his mission? How is this going to be accomplished? Who does God use? Well, who did God use in the Bible? God used Peter, a fisherman. He was used by the Holy Spirit. He saw 3,000 baptized in a day. God used Matthew, an accountant, a tax collector. And uh, he wrote a gospel, ministered in Palestine, then possibly in Ethiopia and Syria. What about Thomas, the doubter? He becomes a missionary, goes to, to India. What about the demoniacs? They witnessed a decapolis, Deca 10 Palace City. So they, they witnessed to those, to those cities. A Samaritan woman, transformed by the grace of Christ, becomes a missionary to her own people. The gospel is sown, and the seed of the gospel is sown. And we find there that Samaria accepts the gospel when Philip goes and preaches. And it goes on and on. God uses ordinary people, people like you, people like me, to do extraordinary things. God allowed persecution to come, to scatter his people so that they would continue preaching God's word. You know, I've had the opportunity of traveling the world and uh, of seeing what God does through ordinary lay people. I've been working a lot recently with Daniel Zhao, who's the president of the Chinese Union. We have about 500,000 members now in China. We're not able to hold public evangelistic meetings, so we have to depend largely on our lay people and a lot of in-home meetings. And you see the fearlessness of these lay people. You see what, what God does for them. Are, do you realize that in China, there are 145 cities with over a million people, 10 cities with 10 million people in them. We have scores of cities in China, million people here, million people there with no Adventists. So not long ago, Pastor Daniel Zhao was talking to one of our lay people and he challenged him. He said, here's a city with a million people. We have no Adventists there. Now this man was a physical therapist and um, 
this man said, look, Pastor Zhao, I'll move to that city. And I want to I wanna start a group in that city. And so this dedicated layman moved to this particular city. What can one person do in a city of a million with no Adventists? Well, he was a physical therapist and a massage specialist. He had a special uh, talent in massage. So he took his table and set it up in the city square, and he put a big sign up saying, free massages. You think you got anybody to come? Free massages. So people began laying on the table. He's massage and massage. And pretty soon there was a man that had a stroke. And this man came along dragging his foot, dragging his foot. And he had great pain in that leg. And our Adventist Lapin looked at him. He said, would you like a massage? And he said, my leg is so painful. And our masseuse said, I think I can, I can massage it. So while he was massaging the leg, the Lord impressed him. Pray for this man and pray that God will work a miracle and that he will get up off your table and walk. As he was massaging, he said, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. But the Lord impressed him again. Pray that this man will get up off the table and walk. As he prayed, he stopped massaging and he said, by the grace of God, get up off the table. I believe you're healed. He said, the man sat to the edge of the bed, gingerly put his foot down, he said, it doesn't hurt. And the man was so excited, he began to jump and leap, ran down the street, ran back, and he said to the massage man, you've got to come to my house, you've got to, my wife's got to see this, my, my neighbor's got to see it, they know what happened to me. They went back to that man's house, and he, all the neighbors came in, and they said, how did that happen? And the Adventist layman said, I prayed over him. And they said, we don't know Christ, we don't know God, but we want to know this God who can work such miracles. Amen. Today, in that city, in a few short months, they have 70 people meeting in an Adventist church. God is working through lay people. We had another lady in China. She was fearless. She had a house church, and each week, they would come and meet in this one room, in this, this house church, and uh, they would have Bible studies there. And they took all the furniture out of the room, because there were about 30 people in it, and they'd put it, stack it in another room. People would sit on the floor, traditional Chinese style. And as they came in to do that, um, they sat there. Sometimes they'd sing, but not too loud. There was a government informant on the top floor, and he told the government about what was happening, and they showed up at that lady's door one day and they said, look, this is against the law to have a meeting in your house like this. And if you do this any longer in your home, you're going to serve a one-year jail sentence. You'll put you in prison for a year. And she said, okay, I won't do it in my home anymore. And she went to her, she said, I promised I wouldn't do it in my home, but I didn't promise I wouldn't do it in anybody else's home. So she got her small group people and they'd have a different meeting in a different home every single week. Well, finally, the government caught on to that, and she was taken to court and put in prison. She was put in a woman's prison that had about 60 other women in it. And as she was there, she would sing in her prison cell, and other ladies began to gather around that prison cell. And as they did, uh, this single, lay, this one woman would share Jesus with them. This was a prison for ladies who were thieves and prostitutes and just a, all kind of prison. But in that prison, there was a revival. And, people, and these ladies began to accept Christ. And as they did, they would start worshiping together in their cells. After six months, the prison warden came to this lady. And he said, look, we made a great mistake in putting you in prison. <laughs> this was a mistake. We never should have done this because before you had to find your converts and we have given you a whole prison of converts. So therefore, we've talked with the judge and we're commuting your sentence. After six months, you can go home now. She said, nothing doing. My prison sentence was a year and it's against the law for you to send me home after a year. My work is not yet finished here. The power of one man, one woman, one boy, one girl. 
when we go to work for Christ, we grow as we go. We grow as we go. As you go to work for Christ, you're going to grow in grace. I love the way that Ellen White puts it in the book Steps to Christ, page 80. If you will go to work as Christ designs, that his disciples shall, and win souls for him, you'll feel the need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge in divine things. Maybe your Christian experience has come to a plateau. Maybe you're in the doldrums of Christian experience. You know where we got that term doldrums from? The Spanish Amata was coming across the Atlantic and it had sp uh, soldiers in it, uh, conquistadors that were going to come, and they had the horses. And in those days, the wind had to blow to keep the sails going. Well, they came out toward the middle of the Atlantic and the wind stopped blowing. And they were sitting there, running out of water. They knew they were going to die unless something happened. You know what they did? Threw the horses overboard because they needed the water that the horses were going to drink. So the doldrums are a place where you come and you're just going to stagnate. Maybe you feel stagnant in your Christian experience. Maybe you'd like a deeper experience with Jesus. Maybe your prayer life has become weak. Maybe your Bible study life has become shallow. Ellen White Steps to Christ, page 80. If you will go to work as Christ designs that his disciples shall and win souls for him, you will do what? Feel the need of a deeper experience. What creates the need of a deeper spiritual experience in our lives as we work for others? Because as you come home from giving out that literature, you come home from giving away books, you come home from giving a Bible study, you feel that burden for that person that you've been working with, and you get on your knees and you pray for them. You feel the... Notice what it says, you'll hunger and thirst after righteousness. You will plead with God. Your faith will be strengthened. Your soul will drink deeper drafts at the well of salvation. Encountering opposition and trials will drive you to Bible, the Bible and prayer. You will grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, and you will develop a rich experience. Listen, the spirit of unselfish labor for others gives depth, stability, Christ-like loveliness to character and brings peace and happiness to its possessor. We grow as we go. As we witness to others, we develop within our own hearts a deeper love for Christ, a deeper love for the Word, a deeper need for prayer. And so we, we then continue to go deeper and deeper and deeper into a more intimate relationship with Christ. The promise of Jesus, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end will come. That promise will be fulfilled by a revived church, one man, one woman, one boy, one girl, making a dramatic difference in the lives of others. But as we go, Christ promises us the power to go. You may feel, you know, I'm weak, I'm inadequate, I don't know what to say, I, I don't know how to, I, I really don't know how to do this witness thing at all. As you go, Christ will equip you. Christ does not call the qualified, he qualifies those he calls. So he, he will qualify you. Look at Matthew chapter 28, a wonderful passage. Matthew 28, you know it well. We look there at Matthew chapter 28. This is right after the resurrection of Christ. He has gone up to the Father. He's ascended to heaven. Now he's come back to give his disciples their final commission. You know, I've been with people that are dying. Man, woman, in the emergency room, or somebody who has been diagnosed with cancer. They've gone through chemotherapy, and they, they, they're now in hospice, and they're dying. And you know what I've noticed? When a husband is holding his wife's hand while she is lying there breathing her last and the kids are there and their ears are bent low to hear mama, nobody is playing computer games on the cell phone. Nobody is wondering what the next sports score is and watching TV. There's no idle chatter. 
every ear is bent low because they want to hear the final words of their mother. They want to know what's on her heart just before her death. Jesus' final words are critically important. These are the final words of Christ before ascending to heaven, leaving his disciples for the last time. We read it there in Matthew 28, verse 16 and onward. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. They doubted then and they doubt now. They doubted there and some doubt here. You have big plans for God and people say, well, well who's going to come? Uh, uh, why do evangelism? You spend all that money. See, some doubt it. God never accomplishes anything great by those who doubt. The doubters are not the ones that are doing the work. God accomplishes something through ordinary, common men and women of faith who he imparts his Holy Spirit to, to touch one life and two lives and three lives for the gospel. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore. Why do we go? Because all authority has been given to Christ. When we go, we go not in our weakness, but in his strength. We go not because we commission ourselves, but because we go in the authority of Christ. Now you see that word authority, all authority? It's an interesting word. In the King James Version of the Bible, I'm reading the New King James, it says, all power is given to me. All power. This is power, but it's not the Greek word dunamis for power, not that word at all. It's power, but it's more than power. It's authority, but it's more than authority. Yes, we go with the power of Christ. Yes, we go with the authority of Christ. But this word exousia is an interesting word. It has to do with victory over the principalities and powers of hell. So what Jesus is saying is, based on the cross of Calvary, he has already gained victory over the principalities and powers of hell. The victory is his. Therefore, you go in his name, he will strengthen you as you go. And God will work through you as you go, giving you the words to speak, giving you the strength and the power and the wisdom to work with others. I love what it says in Psalm 66. Take your Bible, please go back to Psalm 66. Here you have Psalm 66. And look at the promise of the Lord. Psalm 66, verse 3. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Are God's works awesome? Is God going to do an awesome work before our camp meeting? Is God going to do something awesome for you? Look, how awesome are your works? Through the greatness of your power. The greatness of whose power? God's power. Your enemies shall submit themselves to you. How awesome are your works, O God. Even your enemies are going to submit themselves to you. I was holding evangelistic meetings in Pakistan. Couldn't do it today. Pakistan is the largest, second largest, Indonesia is the first Muslim country in the world. Now in that part of the world, uh, when I got up to speak, I had the Parsis sitting over here. Now the Parsis are an interesting people. There are people who uh, descend from Cyrus of Persia. They're very uh, noble people. If you know a Parsi cemetery, because you see these large chimneys, and on the top of the chimneys, they have grates. And when a person dies, they put on top of the grate. The vultures come and eat their flesh. The bones fall through the grate. When they fill that uh, chimney up with bones, then they build another one. So Parsis are interesting. They'd be sitting here. I'd have Muslims sitting over here. Now, in that part of the world, you can't, I couldn't use any graphics of God. Or Jesus, or God, Jesus, okay, but not God. Because if you show a picture of God, there's going to be a riot in the place, you know, with your Muslim population, because they believe that's, that's an image, an idol. And then you have the Dalits. Now, the Dalits are the lowest of the low. They're the street sweepers, and uh, they have some Christian background. So you have all these kind of people in your meetings. In those meetings, I had two bodyguards that stood on the... I didn't have them, I'll tell you about that. One bodyguard stood here, one bodyguard stood there, and they stood like this. The first four meetings, these two men, I had never met them in my life, never said anything to me. So I went over to one of the bodyguards to thank him. I said, thank you so much for standing, keeping order in the meetings. I appreciate your protecting me. He said, look, sir, 
I have nothing to do with you. I'm not here for you. He said, I am commissioned by the owners of this auditorium that if there's a riot here, I have to protect the auditorium, sir. You are on your own. Well, that was very reassuring. One night, we had 21 buses bringing people to the meetings. So one night, so the buses came in. And you know, in that part of the world, you've got men's buses and women's buses. So the women's bus comes in. And the women are nervous. I mean, they're getting off the bus. They're shaking. So I said to one of my translators, go down and find out what's going on with the women. Why are they, why, something's wrong. I don't understand. He came back and he said, look, there were three men that wanted to get on the women's bus. And the bus driver said, no, it's a woman's bus. They got so angry. They said, look, if you don't put us on those buses, we are going to come back with our gang and burn all your buses. So I'm preaching. A flatbed truck pulled up with 20 men in it, 16, usually 18 to 22. They get off the, the, uh, their, their flatbed truck with these torches to burn the buses. I wasn't worried about it because it was going on outside and I was preaching inside. But the Muslim police were there, so they started shooting. And it was a, kind of an interesting story that was going on out there. So anyway, um, 10 of these young men got away, but they brought 10 to the police station, this wild gang. It was about maybe 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was at the Karachi Adventist Hospital sleeping. Conference president comes knocking on my door. He said, Mark, we got a big problem. I said, what is it? He said, you know, in this part of the world, they punish first and they try second. And you know those young men that were going to burn our buses? Yeah, um, Pastor Ditter. I said, yeah, Pastor. He said, you know what's happening? I said, no. He said, they're down at the police station. And down at that police station, they're being whipped. He said, I got the word, these young men, they're just lacerating their backs, they're just whipping them. What should we do? I said, look, pastor, you go down. if I go down to that police station, it's going to be international incident. I can't go. But you go down there right now, and you tell them that we're dropping all charges against these young men, that if the police have no charges, they have to let them go free, because we're not going to testify against them for burning our buses. Well, they didn't actually burn them, but they were coming to do that. So we're not going to do that. You go down and tell them that Christ has forgiven us, so we're going to forgive them and get those young men out of there as quick as you can. So the conference president went down, talked to the police. He said, look, we're not going to press any charges on these young men. We know they're a wild gang, but we want to give them the spirit of forgiveness and another chance. The gang walked out with the conference president out of the prison that night. And as they got out on the steps, the gang leader looked up at the conference president and he said, look, we don't understand. We came to do no good. We came to burn your buses. And you are forgiving us? And this American pastor, Pastor Finley, is not going to, he's telling you to come here and get us out of here? If that's the case, do you think he would let us come and listen to him preach? <laughs> the gang came. We baptized the gang leader. We started a new church. And that gang leader became one of our deacons eventually, and of course not right away. We usually don't have gang leaders become deacons the next day. But, <laughs> but he became one of the deacons in our church. What does our text say? What does our text say? How awesome, How awesome are your works, O oh God? What? Even your enemies, even your enemies will testify of you. I think of Letitia. We just came from Africa, from Kenya, and uh, holding an evangelistic meeting there, 20,000 downlinks, 197,000 people baptized. Letitia was a witch doctor. And Letitia terrorized three villages. I mean, these people were so afraid of this witch doctor with her charms and so forth. What does our text say? How awesome are your works, O oh God? Even your enemies will come to you. But there was something missing in Letitia's life. There was a, she was a bitter, angry woman who wanted to put curses on people. One of our members said, come here, Pastor Finley. And there she watched and heard the grace of God for the first time. Heard about Christ who would embrace her and forgive her, heard about the power of the living Christ that would change her. And Letitia knelt and gave her heart to Jesus. And today she worships with God's people. Amen. When you 
go out by faith. The presence of Christ goes with you. The power of Christ is within you. And Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, works in life. The promise of Christ, the gospel is going to be finished soon. The presence of Christ, the, the power of Christ works through us. And then we look at the presence of Christ. Do you remember what it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20? We go in fulfillment of Christ's promise that the gospel will be preached. If Jesus wanted to use angels to finish his work, he would have done it long ago. We go recognizing that as we go in faith, he imparts his power to us. We go recognizing as well that his presence is with us. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you sometime. Is that what he says? Lo, I'm with you part of the time. Is that what he says? Lo, I'm with you what? Always. How long? Even to what? The end of the age. He says, lo, I'm with you always. When you go out and give a Bible study, Jesus is with you. When you go out to pass out literature, Jesus is with you. When you invite people to come to your home for a small group, Jesus is with you. Jesus says, lo, I'm with you. How, how long? always until when the end of the age and so as we commit our lives to Christ as we commit our lives to share Jesus love as we witness of his grace to others we fulfill his promise we are part of his honor guard witnessing in this world doing a work that angels could not do alone and as we go in his authority, filled with his power, in his strength, he gives us the words to speak. He guides our thoughts. He gives us wisdom to touch that life. But he promises to be with us. And as you open the Bible and share the word of God with others, you will sense the presence of Christ with you. As you give out a piece of literature, you'll sense the presence of Christ. Somebody said to me once, what is the best method of evangelism? And my comment to them was, the one you do, because the one you don't do isn't any good at all. <laughs> it's the one you do. God has given you special gifts. Maybe your ministry is youth ministry. Make it evangelistic. Maybe your ministry is teaching Sabbath school. Make it evangelistic. Pray for those young people in your Sabbath school. Maybe your ministry is health ministry. Reach out and touch somebody for Christ. Openly share that our bodies are the temple of God. We are not in this to make healthy sinners so they burn longer in the lake of fire. Our love and compassion leads us to want people to have the best health here but if my love leads me to want people to have the best health here, would that same love not want me to have, not want them to have eternity? So our ultimate goal is far beyond health. Our ultimate goal is to lead people to know Jesus Christ. Our ultimate goal in our health programs is to develop relationships that break down prejudice so we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our ultimate goal is in whatever we do, whatever ministry we have, Bible study ministry, small group ministry, health ministry, Sabbath school ministry, family life ministry, literature ministry, it all works together for one purpose, to get people ready for heaven. And sometimes it requires personal sacrifice. You cannot win souls unless you're willing to go out of yourself. Somebody said, anybody wrapped up in themselves is a very small package. <laughs> the reason there are so few great soul winners 
is because most people are so absorbed with their own problems that they can't see the problems of others. And if you're going to be a soul winner, if you're going to rise to the destiny that God has given you, why do you sit here today? When you really think about it, and I think about it a lot, you know, I'm 78 years old now, been preaching for 57 years the gospel of Christ around the world. I think about it often. You and I have had no choice of when we were born. Why weren't you born 100 years ago? Why weren't you born 200 years ago? Why are you a human being? Did you have a choice and say, you know, I don't want to be a cow out in the field eating grass. Did you choose? Did you have that choice? I don't want to be a mosquito that somebody swats. Did you have that choice? So the question becomes, why am I born now? Why am I a human being? And why am I at this place at this time? In the divine drama of destiny. God brought you on this scene at this point. Because the unique personality that you have can touch somebody else's life and get them ready for heaven. You were, you were born for this moment. And at times, it requires the sacrifice of our time, the sacrifice of our finances. At times, it requires a sacrifice of going to bring other people into the kingdom of God. John Napoli was an Italian fisherman who often fished off the coast of California. He was living in San Francisco at the time, and uh, 1950, he was out, had been out fishing, and he had, it was a good, good fish, good fishing time. He had caught 3,000 pounds of fish, and they were in kegs, you know, he put them in kegs, and he had his boat coming into the San Francisco har harbor. It was, it was really foggy, really foggy, couldn't see, and the hospital ship Netherlands had gone aground, and when, it, when the hospital ship Netherlands had hit a shallow port part, it, it tilted. People were thrown overboard into the water every place. They were drowning. Napoli guided his vessel in, and as he did, he saw uh, through the fog, he saw this man uh, flailing in the water. He went over and he pulled him in with one arm. Another man was flailing, he pulled him in with one arm. Pretty soon, his boat was filled with people and there was no more room. He threw a keg of fish overboard, pulled in another man. Threw another keg of fish overboard, pulled in another woman. Pretty soon, his boat was filled, people were on the side, and he had thrown 3,000 pounds of fish overboard, a small fortune. They tell me that years later, John Napoli would be walking down the streets of San Francisco, and some man would come up to him, throw his arms around him and say, you pulled me out of the cold waters and rescued me and saved my life, thank you. And that man's wife by that man's side would be crying and say, thank you for saving my husband. There were kids that would walk down the street and their parents would say, that's John Napoli, that's John Napoli, that's the man that saved daddy. And these kids would run up and wrap their arms around Napoli's legs and say, thank you for saving my daddy. Someday, in a land called heaven, in a place called eternity, someday, some man, some woman, some boy, some girl, with tears coming down their face, is going to come and embrace you and say thank you. Amen. Thank you. You worked hard all day, nine hours. You were tired. But you went out and gave a Bible study. And as a result of that, I accepted Jesus. Thank you on that Sabbath afternoon. You gave out a piece of literature, it made all the difference in my life. I read that literature, and it changed me. Thank you so much for conducting that health seminar. You know, I was struggling so much with my health, and I thought if, if you Adventists had something good to say about health, maybe what you say about it is the Bible is credible. And I went to pastor's seminar, and I accepted Jesus. Thank you so much. Some young man, thank you for praying for me. I was brought up in the Adventist church, but I was drifting away. But you prayed for me. You showed me kindness and love in Sabbath school. I never forgot it, and although I, I drifted, 
In my later years, I remembered those teachings you gave me in Sabbath school. And I came back. Thank you. Heaven is going to be a wonderful place. Because one person, one person, one person shared the love of Jesus with somebody else. You can be that man, that woman. You can have the joy of seeing men and women, boys and girls, one for Christ. You can have the greatest joy in life. There is nothing more satisfying, nothing more rewarding, nothing more thrilling than seeing some man, some woman, some boy, some girl come to Jesus. Because one day, Christ will return. And one day, in the clouds of heaven, we will be caught up to meet him in the air. And one day in eternity, we will see Jesus Christ return. And one day, we will live with him forever and ever and ever and rejoice with those who we've been used to lead into his kingdom.